a very good afternoon to everybody we have almost the meet room is almost full with 210 participants there are a lot many people on youtube and facebook also we welcome you all of you in this uh, final session of our international webinar the very important session that is the plenary session of this uh, webinar on on uh, english language teaching and uh, technology uh, here we have with us our plenary speakers already ready there to speak but uh, before we ask them to uh, announce anything i would like to just share a few things uh, here i'm sharing my screen uh, to just have a display about our webinar website uh, as you all know that we time and again have informed you to keep a watch on the webinar website for all the latest uh, updates uh, are there. we are almost now in the last one but we will have a lot of uh, post webinar procedures to be followed about certification and feedback and other things so let me give uh, a kind of a reminder to all the participants uh, here uh, this is uh, our slide uh, when you go to elt and technology you will find uh, several things there i would again like to show you uh, 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 this page that is the match page where uh, we have almost uh, uh, participation from uh, 20 different countries who participated and many of them presented their papers also we have uh, a good number of people from india almost pan uh, india presence we have got and lot many people right, from almost all the states of india have participated most of you are present right now also uh, 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 in this uh, this is the webinar room from where most of you have connected in case uh, if anybody is asking that you are not able to join here there is a live streaming facilities which are made available here so on both youtube and uh, facebook you can see the live streaming things going on you can scroll down to the last one plenary session and on youtube and facebook you can attend the live session here uh, this page is very important for all of you because those are great presentations. If you want a part of your video clippings, you can get it from here. You can download that video from uh, this one. And uh, our, uh, these are our resource persons. Uh, first to come will be Vance Stevens joining us from Malaysia. And uh, I, I know you might have already gone through the profiles and the resources submitted by all three of them. Ben Stevens, uh, what is he going to speak about? He, also, he has already given in advance. Uh, the abstract uh, slides all, also are made available online. If you click on uh, this page, resources, ELT and technology page, and if you go down to resources, uh, you will find this page here where uh, the resources are already given. It will be updated also when Stevens, what is going to speak about his URLs are made available here. Anya Lian has also shared some of the articles about which she is going to uh, speak here. And uh, Heike Philip uh, is going to conduct uh, uh, this uh, uh, live poll, which also is being uh, made available here. Uh, so I hope we all are set to listen our uh, plenary speakers. I would uh, request uh, uh, Vance Stevens, uh, first of all, to uh, share some interesting views uh, on English language teaching and technology, some practical strategies, and uh, to, to combat with the kind of a remote and online teaching. Vance, over to you. Uh, by the time Vance uh, joins us back, uh, let me uh, briefly read his profile. Yeah? Uh, he lives in Penang, Malaysia, and has produced over 465 podcast episodes since two th uh, 2010. And all the things are made available on learningtogether.net. He uh, over 150 publications, many available in full text at vancestevens.com slash papers deal with students using computers to learn languages and teachers learning to teach using technology by engaging in communities of practice and in participatory cultures. 
He facilitates online teacher professional development through numerous communities of, of, of practice. He has helped coordinate TESOL, CALL, IS Electronic Village Online, EVO, since 2003. Uh, most of the things are made available on pbworks.com and has co-moderated EVO Minecraft MOOC for the past six years, made available on minecraftmooc.org. He was uh, uh, recently awarded 2019 Call Research uh, Conference Lifetime Achievement uh, Award. So for almost last two decades, uh, when Stevens is uh, contributing in a, in a very significant way uh, 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 in online learning, professional developments of teachers, and wonderful platforms he is working on. Uh, the links which are given to you, if you will go through those links, you will find that uh, every day, almost every day, he is conducting some webinars and writing a lot about all those webinars. Uh, Pre-writing of webinars, post-writing of webinars, and a tremendous work uh, uh, Vance is doing. But everything is very valuable. We learn a lot by reading uh, uh, the, the pre-conference writings, the post-conference writings from Vance's blog. Around. So those who are planning uh, in future to have any kinds of webinars or online things, what kinds of uh, pre-webinar uh, preparations one needs to do, what kinds of post-webinar activities we need to do, uh, Vance is one of the very significant example for that. I hope Vance is online again uh, uh, and we can again ask Vance to come on the screen uh, if his presentation is ready. Vance, are you yes. there? Sorry, I yeah. got my mic back on. Okay. Well, this, you did a very good job. This is uh, Learning Together episode 470. I was listening to that. Somehow it's not, uh, it looks like I'm going to, this is going to take over my screen, but actually I do have it on the, uh, I have it on the stream over here, so I'll be able to see. So I, I was unable to get that split screen thing back again, but that's okay. So anyway, thank you very much for that introduction. How long do I have to talk? Uh, 30 minutes. 30 minutes, okay. All right, we'll try to uh, We can have some questions for 10 minutes uh, after your talk, yeah. Okay, that's fine. So, let's see, I have, oh, present now, here we go, present, ah, I think that's what it was, a Chrome tab, okay, uh, yes, oh, that's probably what it was, uh, ah, okay, it, it, it should be presenting now, and maybe that's what it needs to do, yes, that actually gives me the split screen, okay, Whew. wow, <laughs> having to cut everything off and bring it back again. Well, that's 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 how you you do it. You know, you just keep trying uh, and, until things work. So sorry, sorry, Vance. Just a minute. Uh, sorry mm -hmm. to interfere. Let, let me tell to the audience that uh, uh, Vance is working on Zoom platform. I think this was the first time that we we did a rehearsal earlier on the Meet platform. So we're trying out whether we can split screen or not. And it is good to see. I think that uh, he is successfully able to do splitting the screen to see the audience as well as the slides there. Yeah. Vance, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was hard to get back, but anyway, it had to be done in a certain order. But anyway, okay, so I'm presenting, and you can see my screen. Yes, I see it here on, on, the, on the feed. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about uh, thinking from, uh, well, actually, it's from thinking small, because this is something I was presenting last year a lot on. Small means social media assisted language learning, as opposed to CAL, computer assisted language learning. So to Talin, Talin is teaching and learning in isolation. Now this is kind of what I'm into now. So uh, uh, Talin is something that it's it's is learningtogether.net is an umbrella for Talin, but I'll talk more about Talin later. But anyway, this is also a Talin is where uh, we're organizing people like Dilip, for example, Dr. Barad. He um, uh, volunteered to do a presentation on uh, in Talon, and uh, we'll, we'll show you later how everyone sees that sort of thing. So 
Oh, by the way, very important. Okay, so you can follow these uh, slides. You can get the slides yourself on your own device and you can follow them. And also, you can get uh, the full text because when I make a presentation, I always start with a full text. And so uh, it, it has a tiny URL. Tiny URL gives you a mnemonic. The mnemonic is Vance 2020 India or it could be India 2020 Vance. One of those gets you to the slides and the other one gets you to the full text. I suggest you have a look at both of those and follow them along because all the links in the slides are all working. But uh, if you go to one, there's a link at the top of that to send you to the other. Okay, so maybe someone could put that in the text chat. So it's uh, tinyurl.com slash Vance 2020 India, or the other way works as well, India 2020 Vance. Okay, I, I'm not, watching the chat so um, okay anyway just to start with early social media I, I went back and uh, looked up the first instances I could find of social media and th this happens to be a, a painting from a cave in India somewhere and it's got pictures of people I don't know riding elephants or horses or herding elephants and horses or hunting them I'm not really sure but anyway it strikes me as being uh, a way, a kind of a way to for people to communicate to other people through uh, through a media, and here's another kind of social media. I don't know if you recognize this one. Um, this is a, a schematic from an American football game, and it's also kind of similar to the previous one because it shows how people should organize themselves and what they should do. Um, and uh, by the way, I got this from Wikipedia. Every all the images I use in my slides, I'm careful that they're not, it's okay for me to use them, they're not copyrighted. So it suggests that people are using this kind of schematic for uh, coming together to accomplish tasks. And then in searching for these images, I came upon this one. Uh, it's from the blog post that you see down there. I didn't actually read the post, but I just uh, this is interesting. Here's somebody on a computer. That's exactly what I'm talking about. This is, you know, he's either spewing out cave paintings or he's trying to get the genie back in the bottle. I'm not really sure, but uh, in any event, that was a nice image. Uh, so I thought that kind of brought us back to the kinds of social media we're talking about now. So in the beginning, we had cave paintings and American football games, etc. Nearer the beginning we in 19 in the 1970s i started using computers myself and this is if you're following the slides you can click on that link and you can actually read this article that i wrote in 1981 because i had been put in charge of developing a cal facility for the university of petroleum minerals in saudi arabia where i was working at the time and we were using back at that time well some people were using these things i don't know if you recognize spirit copiers uh spirit uh, too bad uh, often I like to interact with people in my presentations but anyway a spirit copier is a device where you write on a kind of a special kind of paper and then you send it through the spirit copier and the spirit smells like alcohol it really smells really nice or, you know it's a, a petroleum fumes or something like that anyway uh, but uh, it produces this little thing like you see on the right which is that's the way, basically, before photocopiers, before computers, that's the way we used to communicate with our classes. So at the time I wrote that article I showed you a moment ago, I was working on a DEC mainframe computer. This isn't actually a picture of the exact one I was using in 1979, but it's very similar uh, to the one that I was using. That's a story in itself. But, um, in 19, in about, well, in 1970s, in 1977, I think Apple II was put on the market, and uh, it was the, uh, the computer that brought personal computing to everyone. I bought one in 1981. I'd moved to Hawaii to do my MA, and my computer actually looked very much like that, except that I used a TV screen for a monitor. Uh, I liked to, uh, I, I could touch type, and I used to type my papers and watch football games. That's where the football schematic comes from. So I was a football fan back at the time. And anyway, so it was nice to have that option of you don't actually have, you can be watching television on your screen. It worked that way. The Apple II was a beautiful thing. It was designed mostly by Steve Wozniak, who 
uh, was a hacker, and he designed it so you could get in and work at the innards and you could tweak, tweak things around them. When Stephen Jobs took over the company, he went the opposite direction. Anyway, so that's just to sort of position ourselves back in 1981. And in that year, Stephen Krashen uh, produced a book. The, the, the copy I have here is one that I had on my bookshelves for a long time. It was about I plus one, how we learn second languages. And it's where he, he came up with the idea of the I plus one, which has been kind of debunked since then. But me, I, I always liked the idea that people can acquire languages by listening to it a lot, by getting, you, you always attend to a little bit more than you can actually understand. And through that, you're pulled into learning the language. You can actually download the, the book, uh, Second Language Acquisition and Second Language Learning, uh, which is the one I was actually looking for. You, but there's a link to it. You can get it online and read it there if you're interested. So um, meanwhile, Moving forward a couple of years, I'm finishing my MA. I went to um, um, Toronto to a, I was invited to a symposium on computer-assisted language learning, but I don't, actually we didn't call it that. We called it computer-assisted instruction at the time. And in fact, uh, the Calico Journal, which you see on this, this screen, Calico stands for Computer Language Instruction Consortium. So uh, at that symposium, though, we had to come up. We were going to we were forming an interest section. We had to come up with a name for it, and John Higgins, you might be familiar with John Higgins, I don't know, he's a, a pioneer in Cal, he insisted we call it Cal, not C-A-I, because the mindset for computers in those days was instruction or mastery learning or uh, expert system. The idea was that the programmer was in charge of presenting the, uh, manipulating the learner. Um, of course, it was actually the computer. People thought computers uh, we're doing that. So, but John Higgins was into concordancing. He was into. Um, he wrote a book with Tim Johns. Uh, I think that's in the next screen. Well, I don't know. Missed that one. Okay, so let me back up to that one. Okay. So, anyway, um, yeah. He so he uh, data driven learning. That was they, that was the concordancing aspect. They were into data driven learning. You used comport concordancers so that you could get lots of text, and you could get the students to examine the text through um, through concordancers. So that was the idea that by presenting all this information, you could people could acquire a language kind of the way Krashen suggested they could do it. Then John Siemens in uh, sorry not John Siemens George Siemens in 2004 wrote uh, an article. Uh, a famous article on connectivism. He defined connectivism. And connectivism is what came to the core of all those MOOCs. In 2008, he and uh, Dave Cormier and Stephen Downs produced the first MOOC. That is, they said they would teach a course at, at a university for credit. And they decided to invite everybody in their networks to come and join them. And they thought that would, that's cool, we'll just do that. But what happened was thousands of people decided to join them, at least 2,000. And um, they had to deal with that. And rather than, it was, that's what, uh, Dave Cormier, or possibly Brian Alexander, came up with the term MOOC, Multi-User uh, multi Open Online Course. And the idea behind that course was that chaos, the importance of chaos. And in this picture, uh, George is being interviewed by Howard Reingold. And there's a link at the bottom there that you can find back in my paper, I believe. But anyway, he said in that interview, and I transcribed it. I was so impressed with it. He said, I'm not aware of any research, actually, that says linear structure produces better outcomes than more chaotic meandering structure. No research base for that. Hmm. Our intent is to argue that the experience of learning, making sense of that chaos, is actually the heart of the learning experience. I'm going to go ahead and read this whole thing because I really like it. But if an instructor makes sense of that chaos for you and gives you all the readings and sets the full path in place for you, then you are eviscerating the learner's experience because now you've made sense for them and all you've told them is to walk the path that you've formed. When it comes to complexity, I'm a great fan of letting learners hack their way through that path and getting the value 
of that learning experience and of that sense making process. I kind of felt that that was my my way of learning. There's a uh, somebody I met actually I went to visit him in Croatia. His name is Philip Smolchitz. <clears throat> and uh, before we started uh, dabbling in Minecraft, my friends and I, uh, we were sort of trying to research uh, what we were doing there. We produced this article. But Marianne Smol Smolchitz interviewed her son, Philip, about how he had become so fluent in Minecraft. And uh, basically, he was uh, creating YouTube channels, uh, interacting with other speakers. We have a lot of anecdotal evidence in the six years we've been working with Minecraft about how that works. If you go to the slides, you can read that article. The link is at the bottom of it. So, but, but the thing about uh, chaos, I mean, people don't really like chaos. Teachers don't like chaos. Teachers prefer control sometimes, but it's, it's sort of hard to let go. But that's kind of what you have to do for learning to take place. But there are two codices or two corollaries. That is that uh, I know when I've tried to learn a language like Japanese, for example, uh, that wouldn't have worked for me. <laughs> it was too much input. You know, you had to learn systematically uh, how the language is constructed. At least that, that was a better way for me to learn that. But once you get to a point where you've got the basics down, then maybe you could be into that second codicil, uh, reliance. If uh, teachers make this mistake, I think, they try to give the students support at the beginning, <clears throat> but they really need at some point to withdraw that support. Or the learner needs to take it upon him or herself to just say, okay, never mind. I, you know, they, they say that uh, if you don't want to learn, no one can help you. If you want to learn, no one can stop you. You know, so um, if a learner really wants to learn, that learner then is ready to address chaos. And at the bottom of the slide, I note that the Smolchitz brothers, he and his, he and his brother. Oh, I, I forgot to mention that he told me when I visited him in Croatia that the way they learned to understand Minecraft videos was to watch them, and it was totally incomprehensible to them. But he said after a while, the wall crumbled and the meaning came out. And I think they were able to acquire English through that I plus one method through total immersion, through chaos, because they were mo motivated to do it, first of all. And they had the time to do it. And also, they didn't fall under the, uh, they weren't ranked beginners needing gui guidance in the process of learning themselves. Children don't really need that. Um, and they weren't really in the very early stages of the language. OK, so anyway, getting back to this idea about small, uh, Mike Levy and Phil Hubbard in 2005 wrote uh, an article they called Why Call, Call, Call. <laughs> uh, it's a cute article. Um, they argued that we should, because at the time there was um, a big, well, there's always been a dispute over why computers are everywhere. A computer is a microprocessor, you know, so you mean microprocessor assisted learning? You know, I don't know. Uh, so. My focus has been lately more on what computers do and what people do with computers. But at that time, they wrote this why call, 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 and they uh, said that the, we should retain the term call because it reliably describes what we do. And it's been used for two decades uh, pre previous to that. So we were using it. It's good enough, and we should keep it because otherwise, well, we'd have chaos, right? But they, they included a longevity clause, what I call a longevity clause. In that article on pages 143 to 144, it says, perhaps the label call cannot ultimately make the transition from pre-network to network-based teaching and learning. So, well, guess where we are now? We're more in the era of network-based teaching and learning. So, in around 2009, I've, I've dug around my papers. I've sort of found out where did I start talking about small uh, social media-assisted language learning. The first time I really, I found a slide where I presented it at a conference was in Denver in 2009, and that was the 25th anniversary of the founding of the Cal Interest Section, the one that John Higgins insisted we call Cal. Um, and I, and, and, well, it was about the, the, the you know, asking in, uh, questions about what, what's happening with Cal, 
wither cow, I guess. I said, well, maybe it, maybe the C in cow is almost seamless, almost taken for granted. So uh, social networking is the new front line. So why not call it small? And since then, I've uh, written a lot more articles. There's some, uh, there, actually, that first link, the tinyurl.com slash small2014, that has lots of resources about why I decided to do that. There's also a blog post up there. Anyway, you can read those if you have the slides. So just out of curiosity, I did a Google Scholar search for small uh, to see when it was used in the, in, the, uh, in the literature. And I found no hits in 2009, the year I brought it up. So that's nice. It's kind of my term. And then in 2010, if you, you can filter Google Scholar searches on terms, and you can filter them for years. So if you filter up through 2010, you get one hit, my my hit from my my thing. So, and if I go to 2011, I got another hit. Someone else is using call mesh enter, uh, citing something I had written in 2010, the one that came up in 2010. Anyway, so I, I feel pretty safe that there is, um, you know, that this is a kind of something that not people are not looking a lot at, but. In 2019, last year, we had 10 references. I haven't checked it this year yet. So I've, I've made numerous presentations on small. And um, this slide here gives you a link to a presentation, the last presentation I made at the Cal Research Con Conference in Hong Kong. Um, I was in my living room, as you can see, and my participants were arrayed around a table in Hong Kong. Um, anyway, at that if you link, click on that, though, you can get a list of all the other recordings I've done. Everything is there. All Everything I wrote about small, uh, it's all there. So rather than take more time with that, because it's not just about small, it's about going from small to Talon. How did we get to Talon? Uh, it, it came, actually, in January of this year, which you might, I don't know what you were doing in January of this year, but I, I was in Thailand and people were starting to wear face masks. And uh, and in the north, we went to the north of the country, they had students from China, they were very paranoid about uh, social distancing. People on airplanes, when we flew around, were, were, make, were wearing masks. So I was tasked to, as an English language specialist, to present workshops on using multiliteracies and 21st century skills in your own professional development. And basically, what this was, it was about blended learning. I was supposed to teach or, or yeah, I don't know, model. I, I call it modeling. I was supposed to model for them how to, how to present blended learning. So I used blended learning tools. Everything was online. When they came to the workshops, they said, go to this page. Everything is here, what we're going to do. That's blended learning. Blended learning means you meet people face to face, and you also have an online component. So I did that through January. And then the second part of the assignment was I was supposed to prepare an e-learning component, which would go from February 20th to March 11th. And you possibly can remember, I don't know when your schools closed or, you know, but it might have been in there sometime. It was in that, oh, by the way, the link there, learning how to create and use a blended learning classroom, that takes you to the, uh, the e-learning course itself. So everything I do, I'm, I, I leave everything online. The, paper I wrote for this conference, the slides, they'll be online forever. And and you have the links. And so I'm very open. I like to be open. Uh, and uh, anyway, so this, this course came along at a time when COVID was just, schools were starting to close. People were, became, were getting concerned about this. You know, what, how are we going to do this? And um, here's a, a friend of mine on Facebook said, I wouldn't even know where to begin with teaching my classes this online this semester. Now he's coping with it well. But the thing is, is that, uh, oh, and, and you might click on the link at the bottom there. That's a, a, an interview with Jeff LeBeau, who is in Korea. He's quite, he's been doing blended learning uh, for a long time, gets the students online. Um, he, uh, he came on and he talked to me about this, but what he, what he said was that He'd been doing blended learning for so long that when it came time to go online, it was just a matter, he said, of adding Zoom. I, I know it's more complicated than that, but still, um, the idea is that if you get where I'm going here, blended learning, you need to be good at blended learning in order to then move that online. So if you've got blended learning down, 
then you can move online. The people who are having the most problem were the people who had no idea about blended learning. So the things I was teaching in Thailand and the, the way it all came down, you can see that uh, from some of these uh, things here, there's a Ajahn T was a teacher in Thailand and she said uh, this course was her only hope now, how to manage pl classes in Thailand because uh, I think she was going to travel during this endemic. She probably got out just in time. So anyway, uh, my cat came up with the idea of Talon, uh, and he prepared a Facebook page for me. I'm just kidding, of course. I like to joke during my presentations. Anyway, you can you can see the tiny URL for Talon, Talon and you can go there, uh, Talon 2020. I tried to get Talon, but it wasn't available. So uh, anyway, uh, you can also there's a slideshow about Talon 2020 that I gave at Hika's virtual roundtable conference. And that's there as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about Talon. I've written a blog post about how Talon merged with those, uh, how he came from the e-learning experience. And basically when it stopped on March 11th, it didn't really stop. It couldn't stop because we were immersed in it. We were into it. We were finding out how, how do we get these classes online? How do we help teachers? So I've always had Learning Together going, learningtogether.net. As we mentioned, this is the 470th episode for learningtogether.net. So I decided to sort of open up a, uh, get, uh, make a space that teachers could get together uh, and propose to assist each other in their isolation. And even one, one teacher uh, asked uh, if we could do a regular meeting because he just liked to get together with his friends. So you can read about that if you want. You can read it in more detail. Okay, whoa, something's happened here. What's happened here? Oh, you know something? I've popped out to my, um, I popped out to the blog post itself. How do I get back? Let's see. Um, maybe. Oh, yeah, okay. So if I go here, that should be, I'm having trouble. Sharing this tab to meet nine. Sharing it. Okay. All right. So I'll refresh that tab. There we go. Okay. You've probably got the slides, I hope, in my presentation. I'm going to present that again. Yeah, somehow I popped in that window into the actual blog post. Okay. Moving down to where we were. Sorry about this little glitch. Or maybe you'd like to go back and look over my slides again. Well, you can always, you've got them on your device anyway. Okay, so uh, I'm coming down to the end of this. Um, so there's where we were. Okay, yeah. Well, here's somebody. I don't know who this was, but I, you can. I, I'm sure I can identify him later. But somebody uh, yesterday made a talk that said, especially in teaching of English, the possibility of to of remote education is a real challenge for the teachers. And he was talking about that. And so. Yes, that's true. Uh, I mentioned my EVO Minecraft MOOC. That's something that I did uh, for six years. And that's an interesting aspect. Of, you know, my problem at the time, six years ago, was that I, I wanted to use Minecraft in teaching, and I had no idea how to do it. I didn't even know how to play it. But I mean, I could get the game, and I could kind of figure it out. But the real affordance of that is playing with other people. And if the people, like, Philip Smolchitz, if you want to learn English, that's a way to do it. So, so many people in the K-12 especially uh, were teaching so many things on Minecraft. I really wanted to learn how to do it. I found it very difficult to uh, get into it because it needs people to interact with. And so I couldn't really find people who would let me in because they, they're students there. They won't let an old guy like me into, into their midst. So I just decided, okay, I'll start this EVO session. And what I did is I attracted people who will teach each other, but basically teach me. And <clears throat> you can visit that, uh, that page itself. If you look in the full text for Kuhn and Stevens, you can find the, the, a, an article about uh, how uh, participatory cultures work and getting people together. Now, we're talking about two things here. One is teachers, teaching teachers. And the other thing is teaching students. 
So as far as the process of meeting this challenge, the, there are other uh, initiatives I've taken, like Webheads in Action, for example, which has been going for 20 years. But uh, if you want to know how to do something, you can start a COP and learn with other people. A COP is a community of practice. And engage your social networks. And this is kind of where we're coming from, small social media assisted language learning and social media assisted teacher professional development, I suppose. But um, something to keep in mind, you don't really have to know how to do it in order to engage other people to help you learn it. And the second thing, you practice what you want to learn in your community of practice and you experience. That's what the uh, participatory culture is, is about in Kuhn and Stevens. You experience learning through your social networks by actually doing it. And then you need to archive what you do. You need to make recordings, blog posts, reflect basically, um, and uh, model for one another. How does it get to your students? Okay, so thinking small is a way to um, leverage your social networks to help you learn more about tools like you're doing now. Just by being here, you're becoming more familiar with tools that you could go back and use with your students. And you might follow these steps. You can use your social media tools first with each other in communities of practice. Then, then you'll learn their affordances. You can learn what they do and how you could use them because you'll experience using them. So you'll learn, oh, this could apply to my class. And then you carry what you learn into your teaching. And if you use them in your teaching, in your blended learning environments, you'll be modeling to your students ways that they can use these tools to learn, or basically just a whole paradigm shift about how things that they might do on their cell phones can actually be used in learning. So uh, Talon is a part of learning together. And this is just a slide. I'm coming down to the end of my presentation now. Um, you, it, we, we make archives, we make blog posts. Uh, there's a couple of parts to learning together. Well, actually, if you go to learningtogether.net, there's an about tab there. And if you click on that, you'll come to the parts where we have a wiki which archives all our presentations. They're all archived at learningtogether.net, but there's an index that, uh, that archive, the recording archives link at the bottom is the index for that. So uh, I hope maybe we'll have time for questions. Uh, don't forget, you can get the slides and the full text of this presentation on at these tiny URLs. Oh, shall I stop presenting or leave that up for a moment? I'll wait for your guidance to Hello. Yes. Hello, Bill. Yes. Yeah. Are you, are, you, are you going to show this uh, URLs or do you want? Oh, the URL there. If I click on it, well, one of them is for the slides, which is what I'm showing you now, and the other one is for the full text. So if I click there, let's see what happens. Are you getting okay. the full text? Yeah. I don't know what you see because. Okay. No. No. No worries. No worries. Yeah. Yeah. Just... Because it's a different tab. <laughs> it comes yeah. up in a different tab. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, but you can click on it yourself. So you just uh, either of those are easily accessible for people. We can, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, Vince. Okay, so first time I've given a plenary for one of your uh, conferences. So what happens now? Do do people ask questions or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, some of the questions we have, we also request the other people also, if they have questions, they can put in chat also. Or if they wish to, they can come live and also question, they can take two or three questions here. Uh, one, one question we received was like, uh, uh, when you deal with the people in different countries, what are the problems faced by children? Uh, uh, like country-wise, does it matter a lot? Uh... Dealing with children, I, I, I've i taught at university level, and I've also interacted a lot with teachers since uh, since last century. I've been, actually, I uh, 
I started going online with language learners. I wouldn't say children. They were they were um, um, you know mostly young adults, and they came on to something we called web uh, writing for webheads, not to learn to write, but just to socialize. And they were learning English that way. So, and we were the tools we were using back at the time. That was last century. Kind of carried us into um, uh, into um, t it involved teachers, and so the teachers eventually started took over that community of practice. So these are the people I've been working with. Okay, so um, uh, working with children, we we work them with them in Minecraft, and. Um, I'm not really a teacher. I've got children and grandchildren. And in fact, the children are learning online now. My wife and I are sometimes reading stories and uh, videoing them so that the children can see these. But um, that's not really my experience as a teacher. Elaborate a little on Minecraft. Uh, a good place for that is uh, um, missionsforminecraft.pbworks.com. That's where all the elaboration is, but basically we're learning, we're having a lot of fun playing the game because if you're going to learn something, you need to be having fun doing it. And it's not something that you would want to base a whole course around, but it's often said that uh, when people want to use Minecraft with their students, some people say, well, but is it in the curriculum? And the answer is, well, the curriculum is in Minecraft, you see. so. It's a very flexible tool, and the more you learn about it, the way you learn is you have to start playing it, and uh, it helps if you're a gamer, if you like games. Uh, but anyway, uh, you need people. It's a it's a tool that is not going to be very useful standalone, but uh, you can get um, Minecraft Edu now. You can pay, I think it's twenty dollars a license. Uh, you can, or maybe it's even five dollars a license. Yeah, that's it. I, I bought twenty licenses for five dollars a license. Uh, so it's possible to have it working in a an Office uh, three six five uh, domain enterprise. Small and talent are my acronyms. Yes, social media is language learning, talent teaching, and learning in isolation. Uh, I was uh, part of a community of practice called Teaching and Learning Online. They called it Tallow. And I I was interacting with them at the time, and I thought, teaching and learning in isolation, you know? And that, and that just kind of rang. But yes, in my terms. All right. So anyway, um, there was one early question which was asking about that when we go for remote learning, what are what is the rate of retention among the learners? That's a very good question. It, uh, retention is the opposite of re recidivism, and there have been studies uh, about recidivism when you have um, professional development. So that's a really good question because I've done courses. Well, there's a lady I interact with now called, her name is Lane Marshall, and she was a participant in one of my early courses. And in that course, she was the one who really liked what I was doing, and we've, we've stayed friends ever since. That's uh, 15 years ago. And that's the kind of retention I'm interested in. If you take a MOOC, uh, it's argued that a lot of people drop out of MOOCs, but then that's because it's very easy to click on something and sign up for free and, okay, so you're going to lose 90% of the people just right there. But the, the, if you compare the number of people who matriculate in a course you're teaching face-to-face -face at a university versus the number of people who might re matriculate even with a 90% dropout rate in a MOOC you're teaching, you're probably going to find the MOOC uh, compares quite well. Um, and then recidivism is the other thing that is when people go uh, and, and take courses like this one. I know we're, we're going to have a uh, questionnaire at the end to ask people what uh, what are you going to do now that you have all this information? And they'll they'll be all excited and they'll go back to their class and they'll uh, their, their 
schools and they'll do exactly as they've done before. That's recidivism. So there's a high rate of recidivism. And I think the reason for that is that people aren't interacting with each other. When you start interacting with each other, uh, then you sort of scaffold yourselves, you bootstrap yourselves. I think you know a lot about this, did it? Because we met in uh, Valor in India, I can't remember exactly the year, 2009 maybe, 2008, I can't remember. But, um, and I'm glad that you shaved your beard because now you look the same, although I liked your beard quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but still, uh, there's this connection that got revived through social media. So we've, the people you interact with socially in social media tend to sort of stay with you. You, you. you see them at conferences from time to time, or and when you see them, you feel like you know them. And, uh, or otherwise, you just, um, you might meet people at conferences and meet them again online. So these are, this is the, the kind of interaction that you need to have with professional peers in order, and, and Dilip knows this very well. So um, that's what he does. I can see that's what he does. So, uh, yeah. yeah, that was a good reminder. Like 2008 or nine, it was when we were at Vellore uh, 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 VIT Institute for one international Asia call conference. Uh, mm -hmm. But we, we kept on meeting over social media, like all the three uh, resource persons here today present. Uh, we we are in network only through Facebook, social media. Uh, but my, my question is like uh, still the perception of uh, social media in society or in academia also is not very positive. Personally, I have benefited a lot. What you say is quite true. I have experienced also great benefit academically also. Good networking, good learning, lots of things. Uh, this webinar or the previous national webinar that we have done, uh, we have received more than 1,200 registrations and a huge participation, over 100 people ready to present the paper. Now, everything is happening only because of social media. We are not sending even a single postal letter to anywhere, just posting on social media, and it is reaching out to the nooks and corners of entire India, from Jammu Kashmir to down to Kerala, from east to west, everywhere. A tremendous benefit of social media is there, but still, uh, academia uh, uh, is not taking it in a in a very favorable way. The overall perception of social media is not that positive. Do you have any any answer for that? Uh, yeah, I'm going to let me stop my presentation here. The the answer, I think, hmm. I've got my picture back. Yeah, okay. The answer is coming with COVID-19. Uh, they've got to change. The the uh, people, the, the, the old way of doing things was the problem, not just education, but also the environment and economic inequalities and things like that. So you, we've, we've really got to change these things because, um, and they are going to change, we're being forced to change. So the people who have already changed are at an advantage because uh, having changed now you're you know I, I used to uh, tell people about uh, Microsoft Messenger you know, back in the turn of the century uh, I used to present to them how social media could be used and they in the United Arab Emirates and they said well but we can't use it in our you know it's blocked I said well you know you need to learn it because it's going to be there, and sure enough, all the barriers came aside. So I think academia will come along. I mean, right now, people are not accepting uh, degrees from online universities, online degrees in the UAE, uh, but they're going to have to change because uh, people are going to be getting them. So, you know, it's hard for people to go back to school. It's a wave of the future. Yeah, that's that's true, yeah. COVID has played a very vital role in in the way we accept uh, the very idea of social media. Uh, yeah, way. it's critical right now. Yeah. Okay, so Vance, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks a thank lot you. for your uh, uh, very interesting talk uh, and very inspiring uh, also. Okay. Thanks thank a lot. You. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to request our second uh, plenary speaker, uh, Anya Lian. Uh, a brief uh, intro of uh, Anya Leon I would like to read out. Uh, Anya is one of the...